ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق حديث كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر امور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار وبعد then acts to speak basically uh, as her brother hanif has placed it on the note that he wrote why are we here something explaining the role of the masjid the goals the objectives and i think that the masjid really properly should have defined itself by now it's been open for a while but nevertheless answering his request i say first and foremost that there are certain requirements that we are to have before we endeavor to do what we're trying to do at Masjid Rahmat or anywhere else on earth and that is first and foremost al-ikhlas sincerity and when he says why are we here and why are we here at Masjid Sad I mean Masjid Rahmat why are we here at Masjid Rahmat the Masjid of Mercy inshallah ta'ala and we have thought of another name but really this is the name that is required in this place in this particular place at this particular time this matter of mercy rahma but we find that it's almost non existent we find it almost non existent nevertheless the first and foremost matter that we need jazakallah khair is al ikhlas sincerity and this can be achieved in many ways but one of the important issues to think about regarding ikhlas is that to hide your good deeds like you hide your bad deeds to conceal your good deeds like you conceal your bad deeds you know a person will go through all types of striving to make sure that their bad deeds are concealed they don't want to talk about it they don't want even it to be suspected of them so to hide the good deeds like that because there and I've lived in this area before and there is a a issue that talks and goes around which involves bragging and which involves that I've done this and I've read that and I studied this and I memorized that it it is so apparent sometimes that if an individual doesn't involve or indulge in that that person is considered like he doesn't have anything obviously he doesn't know anything obviously he hasn't studied anything why because he's not bragging about it everybody brags about what they know well this is the opposite of ikhlas and here when we talk about masjid rahmat this is something we want to avoid we want to avoid this issue uh, of bragging and this issue of hubb dhuhur loving to be shown or loving to appear loving to be known yushiru ilayka bin banan that you pointed to this is this is not the way of the salaf and it is that with even if you had ikhlas if the people start to act like this you may lose your ikhlas your sincerity so the first thing is that issue of hiding the good deeds like you hide your bad deeds your good deed is for Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala leave it between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but if someone unaware unbeknownst to you finds out about it then that's another issue and there's an example of that with Imam Bukhari rahimullah there sits a man was sitting with Imam Bukhari and Imam Bukhari rahimullah was talking to him and noticed that there was some type of filth upon the uh, uh, floor of the masjid 
So Imam Bukhari waited till the man left. Then he picked up the filth and placed it in his pocket. But unbeknownst to him, the man had looked back around and saw him. But this is how the salaf were. He could have put it up in front of him. Most of us would have done that. But he wanted this deed to be sincerely for Allah Ta'ala alone. And this is how they were regarding their issues. That if they made the hajjit, like in the hadith of the, the well-known hadith that, that says that we will receive rain because of such and such star, one of the sahaba was up that night. And, he's, and he didn't want them to think that he was making tahajjit. So he said, something stung me. I was up that night. And then immediately when they asked, you know, when they, why were you not tahajjit, not qiyam al layl? He didn't want them to know. He would hide that. No, I, I was stung by something. Something stung me, disturbed me, and I was up. We have to any, uh, have this quality. We have to have this quality. Another thing that we want to avoid is Iqrab wa ashayil alladhi yudahish al-nas. Adness. Adness, being ad. We're not talking about being strange or being upon the sunnah. We're talking about being ad. Doing something that is not the norm amongst the people. Because this comes into also a desire to what? Be known. Everyone else is doing this and what? He's doing that. And yudahish al-nas. Surprise the people. Astonishing the people. Why you do, well, you didn't know this sunnah? Right? To surprise the people. It's not to teach them. For it was to teach them, you would have related it to them, and then you would have done it. And you want to do something in the middle of everyone that makes everybody look at you, and it's strange, and it's odd, and it's you know, extraordinary. What happened? What did he do? Like this. We want to avoid this type of matter also. So if we say what is the role here and what is our purpose here, purpose here is the purpose wherever it is, wherever you may be upon the earth. To worship Allah Ta'ala alone and ascribe nothing to him. Wherever you, we may be, it is to worship Allah Ta'ala alone. And the proper manner of doing that is in following Mustafa Salawatullahi wa sallam alayhi. To be in muwafaqa, in agreement with what Mustafa Salawatullahi wa sallam alayhi was upon. And as the Bedouin Arab said to that tyrant Persian ruler, we came to call the creation from the worship of the creation to the worship of the Lord of the creation. Min ibadat al khalq, from the worship of creation, illa ibadat al rabb al khalq, to the worship of the Lord of creation. And this is the, the, the main purpose. The main purpose. So that you we will we will focus as we always do upon Tawheed. Tawheed must be studied. Tawheed must be learned. Tawheed must be memorized. Tawheed must be conveyed. Tawheed must be implemented. This is the whole issue. This is going to be the greatest focus, of course, of anybody who is on the Dawah of Salafiyyah. The Dawah to Atharia, the Dawah Kitab of Sunnah, the Dawah of those upon the way of the Salaf, he's going to focus upon Tawheed first and foremost. And he's going to start with himself, which many of us don't do. We don't start with ourselves, we start with outside the bait. We start with outside the house. But we are to focus first and foremost upon Islah Naf, correcting ourselves and those most closest to us, our wives and our children. Then it goes outside. As, they, as the old saying goes, charity begins at home. Huh? You, got, you got that together, then you move on from there. And many of us don't focus on the home. Every place, every place has a role in our lives. The masjid, the bait, the madrasa, if we have a proper one, all of them have roles in our lives. And we start with the household and ourselves, and then we branch out from there. Also, the masjid is a place of learning. And it means we have to have people that come out and, and sit in the circles. Some of them, for some brothers, may be a reminder. 
But Allah said, remind them for reminding benefit the believer. Some of it, as, I, as, I, as I'm here more, I notice, some of it for some is the beginning. They never really studied the deen. They never really studied Tawheed. They never really studied the six principles of faith. They never really studied the five pillars. They never really studied the matters uh, of worship and, and, and so on and so forth. And this is found in many ways. Found in many ways by questions that you get from various brothers. It indicates to you that they did not study these issues. From the talking that you hear in Juma, it indicates to you that these are people who have attended, who are attending Juma, who never understood the etiquette of Juma and don't know that they've blown their Juma by opening their mouths. And all of us together must be involved. This is not the masjid of Hanif or the masjid of Abdul Hakim or the masjid of this brother or that brother. This is the masjid, this is the house of Allah Taala. And so it's a masjid for anybody who wants to worship Allah Taala. So therefore, if you see something dirty, you clean it. Why? Not because of this brother on the shore or that brother there or this brother there, but for the pleasure of Allah Taala, you clean the masjid. Well, you see some deficiency, some nuks, something that needs to be corrected. Then you approach those who are representatives of you in a sense of authority in the masjid. Then an authority in the masjid is not something that's an honor. It's a responsibility and a duty. It's a responsibility and a duty. It's something that is going to be heavy on the shoulders of the individual. So, I mean, to make that mas'uliyah, that responsibility easier, give him nasiha. Pull him aside and, brother, I noticed this. Well, you should do this and you should do that. This is nasiha, which is another matter that we need to inculcate in our lives. Is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ad-deen nasiha ad-deen nasiha ad-deen nasiha Sincere advising of one another. And it's the difference between nasiha and ta'ayir, as Ibn Rajab wrote a book about it. Nasiha and exposing someone. It's not our goal and will not be our goal, bi'ithnillah, from this member that is behind me or from the lectures in here to expose individuals. It's not the purpose. For we want what Allah Taala stated when he said, he who covers the faults of a believer, Allah Taala will cover his faults on the day of judgment. There Allah Taala covers faults and he loves from his servants to cover faults. So exposing is one thing. Nasiha is another. Nasiha is where you pull a brother aside and you have some rahmah and some mercy and some lutz and some gentleness and some concern. And you are telling him and you have no ulterior motive in your heart, but you are speaking purely for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, hoping that he will accept your advice. And this is where the word nasiha comes from in Arabic. Is when you when you cleanse the honey, nasah al asl. You cleanse the honey from what what particular particles have fallen in it. So you don't have anything negative in your heart, and you are just you have noticed a speck on the face of your brother, and the believer is a mirror to to, to his brother. So therefore, the speck that you have had before, you've noticed it upon him, and you are trying to correct it, and you are trying to remove it, and you are trying to rectify him. A nasiha. So the masjid will be from that standpoint also where we learn nasiha, where we learn how to give advice, where we learn how to show respect, where we learn how to have patience. A sabr is a must in this, in this issue, to have sabr. You're not going to hear everything or all the time what you like to hear. But you're still ordered by Allah to be around your brothers, to pray with your brothers, to mix with your brothers, to eat with your brothers, to sit with your brothers, to talk with your brothers. And your brothers may do that from time to time due to shaitan or due to their nuts or due to their desires or their shortcomings which offend you. Then you have to have what the Salaf had which was been the ability of carrying something heavy. To hamil. To carry something. Something you might dislike. Something that you, that, you know, that, that offends you. But you carry that. The hill with forbearance. For the general good that comes out of it. And for the fact that the brotherhood itself is something very, very expensive. 
And when you have something very expensive, you protect it and you guard it and you don't let it, you don't want to lose it or let it go to nothing. So this is what, these are the things we have to do. And if we think about it, this is what we intended from the get-go when we first came into the deen of Allah or when we learned about these issues, but we got sidestepped here or there. Someone came along and told us something else. Someone came along and gave us another plan. Someone came along and gave us another program. Well, we want the program of Allah Ta'ala and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi that which is the program that the Salaf Salih were on. There are many issues and there are many matters which we could discuss, but in general, what has to happen is that everyone realizes that this is everyone's masjid. It is not a masjid for the brothers in Newark, but it's a masjid for anyone on the face of the earth who wants to come and worship Allah Taala in this particular locality. Anyone who wants to worship Allah Taala in this particular locality. And come learn the deen of Allah Taala and come advise the brothers. Everyone has, has deficiencies. Everyone has faults. Everyone is aware of some things and unaware of others. You know, I mean, it's a reality that I may advise you of something today. And then two or three days later, you see me doing the same thing and I need you to advise me. I've forgotten what I advised you about. To the degree you could probably say, brother, didn't you just tell me such and such and such and such? But this reality that insan, they say the man was called insan because he nasiya, he forgets. Often forgets and has to be reminded constantly. Constantly reminded. There's a day coming, there's an akhirah, there's qiyamah, there's jannah, there's nah, there's malaika. Constantly reminded, constantly reminded. The day for you to leave this world is coming. You don't know when. You don't know what will happen or how it will happen, but definitely will happen. And you will meet Allah Ta'ala who knows all that you conceal and all that you reveal. And no one can protect you from Allah Ta'ala. And if he makes a decision regarding your destination to, the, uh, to a place other than what you wanted to go, then that will be the direction that you will take. May Allah protect us all from that. But these are the realities of what we have to remind one another about, particularly when we're asked. Where we act is it's abhorrent. It's 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 beyond belief. Man can memorize ten ayat and go outside and lose it. Ten ayat, God, I had it in the musket. Ten ayat, come out, look, it's gone. Abhorror, delusion. Khilatul awan. Very few people to help you do good. You want to do shar evil? You got multitudes to help you. Multitudes to help you. Hey, take this, pay me back. Don't no, pay me back. Multitudes. If you want to do khayr, very few people is in support of that. Very few people is in support of that. So it takes a lot of tadhiyah, sacrifice, and a lot of striving. And we, we are supposed to be able to depend upon one another in this regard. As the Prophet said, the believers are like one building. You know, one brick upon the other. And another narration says, like one body. All of these narrations we know, it's just a matter of taking them out of, 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 of the books and implementing them into our lives. Implementing it into our lives. When we look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions, this is the first difference that we notice from that generation and this generation and all the generations that have been successful versus generations that have failed themselves and have failed the Muslims, and that is that the acting upon the knowledge. What does it benefit us if we memorize the whole Quran, or memorize all of Bukhari, or memorize Muslim, or memorize yeah, and Usul al Talatha, and Aqid al Tahawiyya, and Kawa'id al Arba, and Kafsh al Shubuhat, and Fatawa Hamawiyya, and Risala al Tatmariyya? What does it memorize if we memorize? What does it benefit if we memorize all that and we don't implement anything of it? Don't implement anything of it. It is implement implementation and actually practically living this Islam the day to day basis, living Aqidah Tahawiyah to your to your walk in Aqidah Tahawiyah, to your walk in Risalat Tatmariyah, to your walk in Usul Talatha, 
So you're all walking like this. When it becomes that, it becomes reality that we're living. Now for us, many of us is on the shelf. And many of us who have been exposed to the real Salafi Dawah, not the slogan, not the mirrors and smoke, but the real Salafi Dawah, have not the ability yet to express it to others so that they can come and partake of it. It is really horrible and horrendous. And any other word I could find in the English language, but I'm not clicking like that tonight. That the dawah, a dawah called Salafiyya has been in this area since the last decade. And very few people in this area know it. Very few people in this area know it. And they ascribe to it ugly names and titles. Some of it is due to the fact that Ahl al-Batil don't like haq, no matter how much of it is shown. But some of it is due to the character, the manner, and the way Salafi has been presented. And it's not been presented as a rahma, rahma, a guided mercy. Not been presented as that which was sincere to the creatures of Allah Taala to bring those creatures' hearts in contact with Allah Taala and in submission to Allah Taala. Not been presented like that. Not been presented like someone who has shafaqa, someone who has a, a sincere mercy. And this is how Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. Look at all those narrations and look at all those ayat that if Allah said, you're about to cry yourself, you're about to cry out of sorrow that they don't believe in that which is revealed to you. But to cry out of sorrow. And this is how the Prophet sallallahu was merciful. And he went to, came to the creation. He gave us a, the example of being like a man who lit a fire. And all the insects are attracted to the fire. And he said, I'm standing there and I'm pushing you away. Like you push insects away. And this shows the amount of uh, activity and concern that the Prophet ﷺ had. That physically he's pushing, if you can imagine, pushing insects away. As much as they are attracted to the light and they constantly come. And you've lit this in an area that is open. Right? He said, this is how I am with you. Pushing you, pushing you. And you keep running into the fire. Has the Dawah Salafi been presented to people on that level? That it is a call to all the creation. It is, what is it if you, let's not get caught up on the terms. Take the word Salafi away, Athari away, Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. What is it but the Sirat al Mustaqim? What is it but the true Islam that Allah Taala revealed from the heavens? What is it but practicing the deen? That Muhammad and Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions were upon. In our belief, in our worship, in our manners, in our morals, in our whole way of life. That's all it is. How you understand, understanding the deen, be fahm sahih correct understanding. No one has infiltrated, no one has uh, uh, came in and polluted your understanding of what Allah Ta'ala revealed from the heavens. You're up on clarity. And ta'ala basira. You're up on clarity. This is all it is. But sometimes we get caught up in the slogan. Like I said, a brother saying sunnah, sunnah, sunnah. And how he ever picked up a book of hadith. You ask him, well, have you read all of Bukhari? No. English, no Arabic? No. Have you read all four volumes of Muslim? No. English or Arabic? No. Have you read all of Riyadh al-Salihin? No. English or Arabic? No. Have you read all the 40 Hadith? No. No. English or Arabic? No. And how do you keep saying Sunnah? The Sunnah is in one valley and you in another. The Sunnah is somewhere else. The one who really loves the Sunnah is going to be reading those books. Along with Quran, along with Tafsir, he's going to be reading those books. And the more you read those books, even if you don't memorize them, you become familiar with the personality of the Prophet. 
as if you could almost picture him in certain events that take place, certain situations that take place. You read the story of Tabuk and the three that remain behind. And you see Kaab saying he came to him. And the Prophet Salam smiled at me, but a smile with anger. You, you, you picture this. Right? The Prophet Salam left his wives and, man, and was laying in an attic. And Umar came to him. You picture this. The Prophet Salam entered Mecca with a black imam on, on you know, with his head uh, pressed against the camel, making dua to Allah Taala. You picture this. You become familiar with his personality so you don't have any time for anybody else's personality. You become familiar with the shaqs of the Prophet salam, his personality, so you don't have time for shaqsiyya, calling anybody else, anybody else's personality. And that's another issue of the masjid. That the masjid, rahma, any other masjid trying to be a bonkey tat with Sunnah is against those two illnesses of shaqsiyya and his beer, of personality following, and I don't want to say worship, some say worship, but if you worship, you're really outside of Islam, you get to that level, but personality following, and his biya, any partisanship, clicking up, making ourselves in the group, us and them, you know, you know we, how we, and how they are, and you're talking about your brothers, <laughs> Come here, come here, let me tell you. Yeah, one of those type of things. And Hassan Abbas Rahimullah said and others that if you see people getting together in secret, you know that they're upon a dalala. No, you're in the masjid, the house of Allah, you're going to gather in secret three or four brothers, five or six brothers, stay away from here. You have your member card, you have your ID. This is not ID. Similarly, at ta'asab al dameen being obstinate or prejudicially obstinate and sticking to the view of one scholar. This is now on days going on. And that means that we respect all of the scholars. And we say, as Imam Tahawi says in Aqeedah, and he whoever mentions them, in an evil way, he's not upon the path. We don't accept any ta'an of the scholar. Any way you want to do it. You want to be direct with it or you want to be indirect. Any type of ta'an, fault finding regarding the scholars and trying to make individuals belittle the scholars or trying to talk about them in a nasty way. Because if we believe they are scholars, then we must believe what the Prophet said, that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets of Allah. And who inherits from the prophets? Those who are far away from them or those who are most closest to them? Those who are most closest to them. So if they are in fact scholars, then they are inheritors of the Prophet wasallam, and the most closest to the Prophet wasallam. So if that is the case, then why are you opening your mouth in a negative way? Rather, sarihatun, yani openly, or isharatun, pointing something out indirectly. So we respect all of the scholars, but we also respect a tachassus. Those who are specialists, that among the scholars are those who are specialists in tafsir. Fa'alayka bihi fi tafsir. You must benefit from him in tafsir. And among the scholars are those who are mutakhassas. All of them generally are aqeedah salima. No doubt about it. All of them are correct aqeedah. But those who are like oceans in aqeedah, mutakhassas fil aqeedah, specialists in aqeedah, alayka bihi fil aqeedah. And amongst the scholars, those who are mutakhassas fil jahwa ta'adir. So if you have a problem in jahwa ta'adir, alayka bihi fi hadha. And amongst the scholars are those who are mutakhassas in the matters of talaq, well, hula, and all the stuff that we, we hear so often, yani, that area of fit. So if you have a problem with that, then like that. Respecting the specialist, respecting the fact that Allah Ta'ala gives his virtue or gives his bounty to whoever he wills of his servant and has given certain servants certain things or certain servants other is the best form of, is nothing but adil, of nothing being just. 
but being just. Nothing but being just. So we respect that. And we respect all of the scholars. And of course, we rely and refer more to the major scholars. And this is only natural. Or by the fact that they are, in fact, major scholars. And if we can't get to the major scholars, then we get to those most close to them. And we can't get to those most close to them. Then we get to those after that and after that until you might come to a mutamakin, a, a talib a al established student of knowledge, or you might come to a, an alam sagheer, a small alam, or whatever the case. But with all of this, we believe that none of, no individual by himself is perfect. No matter how knowledgeable he is, no individual by himself is perfect. It is possible, and it's, it, and it's no doubt, it's almost certain that he will make mistakes. But having said that, then that means that whatever truth is taken, it is taken from whoever comes with it. And if a great scholar makes mistakes, it is us to correct them or someone on his level to correct them. If it's us to correct them, or someone on his level to correct them. A great scholar. It would be someone on his level to correct them. I mean, unless, you know, it's, uh, you bump into him at the masjid or something. And you see him going in there with his left foot rather than his right. You see, yeah, you know, something of that nature. Servant that knows his level. We must realize that we are in the beginning of the path. The beginning of the journey. Yesterday we might not have known who our Lord was. I'm not talking about yesterday being Thursday. Yesterday being a year ago, two years, four so for some, five for others, ten for others, a decade for others, two decades for others. That's not that's not much. But we have to realize this issue. And that is, is that this is a blessing from Allah to Ta'ala to even be upon anything that is known as Kitab is put in the way of Salaf Salah. So the masjid's role is going to be, inshallah ta'ala, one of that. And we are in need of everybody. All hands must be upon deck. Everybody who can take some time and come and benefit and help and assist and support. Someone can teach someone Al-Fatiha who doesn't know Al-Fatiha well. Someone can teach someone Wudu who doesn't know Wudu well. Someone can teach someone Tawhammum. In case there's a need for him to do that. Someone can teach someone this and someone that. This is how it is. We benefit and we benefit others. We learn and we teach others. We advise and we accept advice. Right? We forget and we have to be reminded. We remind others because they forget. This is how a brotherhood and a sisterhood and a community works. We, a lot of us don't know how community works. We think community is always hair splitting and arguing and bickering. Three of these four brothers against five or six of those brothers. That's not community. That's not brotherhood. And another matter is that the role of the masjid should be natural. It should be a natural part of our lives. Sometimes there's a zeal for some brothers. Uh, a thing of melon or boredom comes over them. I don't know what it is. But you can find communities that be going so well, and it's like, this is just too good to be true. Let's come up with something. Let's, you know, let's try, let's cause some type of excitement. This is exciting enough. Is it exciting enough to be worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, funky tawa sunnah? I mean, this is, this is beyond belief. This is off the wire. That, 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 that in an area like this, you got a vimin called five times a day and people come in the masjid and up on sunnah and you know, this is Allah Akbar. So what more excitement do you need? So if the masjid has a natural natural position in our lives that have a natural flow. Going to the bait of Allah Ta'ala, worshiping Allah Ta'ala. This is the this is the issue. And of course there's many issues I guess that we can go into. And that, uh, regarding that, like I said, the shura of the masjid is, is such that it is a responsibility. And as, uh, we had some advices, this is something good done by the brothers here, 
that before they started the masjid, they asked for advices from various scholars and students of knowledge. I myself recall the master Sheikh Hisham Arif, who uh, is, and he is a uh, lecturer in Masjid Al Aqsa at that time. And I translated for them on that tape. And they asked also Abdullah Al Bukhari, and they asked Ubaid Al Jabari, and they asked others and others and others about issues regarding the masjid. And this is how you should do. Al Alm Qabla Qawwal Amal. Ani, Asulu Talasa. And it's Sahih Bukhari, where it comes from. Al-ilm qabla qawwal amal. Knowledge comes before any saying or deed. So how, what should we do? And he said that the shura and those responsible must be khutwa, a good example. And they must be from the akhyar, from the best. And they must be like the first in the saf al-awwal, in the masjid. They must be the ones who are the first to rush to do good. And this is this is something known, that the one who's going to be in a position of responsibility, he has to be the first and foremost. This is what the Prophet ﷺ was like. Prophet ﷺ wasn't sitting around with a belly full and his pants was hungry. When they pulled up their shirts and showed him stones tied to their bellies, he pulled up his shirt and showed them stones tied to his belly. I'm like you in this regard. When it came to the khandak and digging the khandak, Prophet Islam was out there with his shirt off and carrying the bricks away. And at first, those who are going to be responsible are going to be the first. Have to be the first in the, in the field of, of, of activity to do what, it, what, it, what it's called to do. And we must have this desire of not, or this, this matter of not wanting position. Nobody should want position. And if we have that type of, of malady, we need to deal with it. But when we are entrusted with a position, our attitude should be that this is the battlefield and the enemy won't come through this way. The enemy won't come through this way. Won't get through because I'm sleeping or I'm negligent or I'm not on my job. You can rest, you can rest assured, you can sleep easy, you can feel at ease. I got this. This is how the mokum should be. That if I'm going to do something, like the Prophet said in the authentic hadith, and it, if you're going to do something, do it well. All right? So if you slaughter, make sure that your, uh, your sword or your knife is sharp to show mercy to the animal that you're slaughtering. That's the hadith, but the ihsan, to do well, is what we want to take from that narration. To do well, if you're entrusted with something, do it well. If you're going to call a thine, with all the rewards that a thine has, of the fact that the believer's neck being, the Mu'addin's neck being very, very long. And it said that uh, one of the many reasons of that is the fact that when everybody sweats on the day of judgment, because as you know, the sun will come near, and it will come near as close as a meal, as they say. And meal can mean the mile, as we know, or it can mean that which is the instrument for putting coal in your eyes. That's how close the sun would be. And that the people would sweat to their, to their ankles and to their knees and to the half of their bodies and to they are, their mouths are shut due to sweat. Muad doesn't want to suffer any of that because his neck is very long. So we know the fada'il or the virtues of calling Adhan and the authentic narrations regarding calling Adhan then if we are interested to call it that, do we have to call it off on time, and we have to call it in the proper way, and so on and so forth. And this is for anybody, whatever responsibility we take. If you take the position of treasure, then what the Muslims have, you don't let one cent be spent. You don't let one cent be spent, because it's not your money. And because Allah is going to call you to account for what you do with it, you make sure that every cent is placed in the proper place. And if you've got some other compassion, whatever you're doing for the masjid or for the Muslims, that you do it well. You do it well. This is something very, very important and something that must be understood. Also, the masjid was the place, as we can see now, where we teach our children, where we instruct our children. Besides the madrasa, they will learn certain things at the madrasa and certain things they will learn in the masjid. Certain things they can't learn in the madrasa. 
but they can in fact learn in the masjid. And this is also its role. It has many roles and it has many benefits and it has a message to deliver to the whole world in general and to the believers in particular. And many of the masajid don't fulfill the role they're supposed to feel, fulfill. We have, inshallah, to do also Friday lectures such as this. And we have said that we would do it based upon suggestions from people, based upon illnesses or maladies or problems that are in the community that, that need to be addressed. So that we are find a remedy for those particular maladies. And your brother will say, well, we got too much envy amongst us. So give us a lecture on envy. Friday night lecture on envy. Well, we got too much, you know, khiana, deceit amongst us. Give us a lecture on khiana. Friday lecture on khiana. And like this. So that everyone, inshallah ta'ala, besides the other lectures that uh, we will be having, everyone will benefit bi idnillahi ta'ala. But I say it again, it, it calls upon all hands to be upon deck. Everyone who considers himself a soldier, the soldiers of Allah Taala, to be uh, in the unit, in the unit, on time, in this masjid. And another factor is connecting ourselves, I said, with the kibar and the ulama in general, and that is through maybe translations and making available things that some brothers probably read and other brothers probably don't read. Sometimes some brothers might get this or that from the internet. Other brothers aren't exposed to any of that. The knowledge itself has to be such that it's commonly to everybody. Everybody has this knowledge. Not the same level of knowledge, but the knowledge of Kitab, Sunnah, and where it starts out. This is how it was in the time of the Prophet and the companions. Example is the slave girl. Sheikh Nas used the example often. The slave girl, when that Sahabi, Muawiyah, uh, beat his slave girl, and he came to the Prophet, wanted to make Toba for whatever. Prophet said, Well, what, what do you want to do? I want to free her. He said, Bring her here. What did he do? He asked her, Where is Allah? She pointed up. And if it's Sama, Allah is above. All right? Who am I? You're Rasulullah. You're the Messenger of Allah. He said, free her, she's a believer. A slave girl. Out, the bed, the bed, out in the desert. Away from the community. Not attending the circles of the Prophet. Not attending the lessons of the Prophet. Yet she knew this aqidah. She knew this aqidah. So this is an issue that is important. And we must make sure that just like that slave girl knew it. That all of us should also know it. All of us should also know it and make sure others know it. This is some of what I wanted to say. I'll leave a period of time for questions, inshallah ta'ala, or advices, or nasiha, or ta'aliqat, or comments, or whatever. Hadha wa sallallahu ala nabiyyana Muhammad.